that the British did not divide and rule India, they exploited an existing division. The creation of our neighbors to the left and right, to the east and west, was not the product of an overnight decision of a foreigner. That a division was created between two communities within a period of one year, or two years, or five years, if they have peacefully coexisted for thousands of years. So the much hated figure, namely the politician, is always cunning, is always selfish, and is looking out for his self-interest. Science doesn't care for sentiments, it only cares for the truth. Similarly, history doesn't care for sentiments, it only cares for the truth. There is no point in saying Satyameva Jayate if you cannot handle Satya in the first place. The situation of 2024 is closer to the situation and the circumstances of 1924 when Khilafat 1.0 ended in December 1924. Do you truly believe that the last 75 years tell us the story of a situation where the Indian identity has prevailed over religious identities? If the answer is a no, my simple question would be, when do you think we'll wake up and smell the coffee? I'm grateful to His Excellency, the Honorable Governor, Sri Arun Ravi, for having organized this timely event. And I don't think there could have been a better campus to have this conversation than IIT Madras. I'm grateful to the Director for lending this space for this event. And I hope that we have some meaningful and deep conversations in the limited time that we have. As a lawyer, I struggle to contain my argumentative nature or to object. So let me start with a few objections to what was said before me. I agree fully with the need to remember the 14th of August and what it signifies. I fully agree that we must draw the lessons from the partition and the causes behind it. But perhaps I disagree with what those causes are. And I perhaps have fairly clear and strong views on what led to the partition. The standard narrative that you'll be taught in textbooks is that the British imposed a partition overnight or that selfish politicians chose to divide the country because they wanted pieces of land for themselves. Allow me to say this with no intention to sound condescending or patronizing. These are comfortable fictions which are meant to be taught only in school textbooks. Adults shouldn't buy this. Because I don't believe that the partition was caused overnight by the British man as if the rest of us were gullible people to walk with that particular decision without any questions being asked. It is precisely to bust comfortable myths and fictions such as these that I was forced to write the second book titled India, Bharat and Pakistan. Because my reading of history based on credible sources and first-hand sources clearly tells me that the British did not divide and rule India. They exploited an existing division. There is a difference. If there is no controversy or dispute between two parties and somebody chooses to invent a fight between the two of them, that is called divide and rule. But if there is a pre-existing division, and someone chooses to take advantage of it, that is not called divide and rule. It's called use the division and rule. The creation of our neighbors to the left and right, to the east and west, was not the product of an overnight decision of a foreigner. That decision was already taken by an existing segment of the population at least for 200 years, before the partition. Because that division existed for at least 800 years before the partition. I am not here to offer answers. Perhaps what I will do is that I will share a few questions so that 
befitting the campus in which this conversation is happening, students go back with questions to work on, as opposed to me spoon feeding them with answers. If two segments of the population or two communities have peacefully coexisted for thousands of years, does common sense tell you that a division was created between two communities within a period of one year or two years or five years if they have peacefully coexisted for thousands of years? If the answer is a no, then the basic question that you should be asking is, did they peacefully coexist for thousands of years? That is perhaps the more important question to be asked, considering the ongoing events in our neighborhood over the last few weeks. Three, let us assume for a moment that the much-hated figure, namely the politician, is always cunning, is always selfish, and is looking out for his self-interest. But what do you make of the people who support those decisions? After all, the public participated in those decisions one way or the other. Partition was not a decision that was taken by a politician without support from his people. In fact, there was democratic support for the decision, which was clear from the elections of 1946. So perhaps when we wish to draw lessons from the partition 75 or 78 years down the line, in my opinion, these lessons should have been drawn in at least 1947 or 1948. We are doing it 75 years late. But at least now we should be framing the question properly and asking the right questions. Whether they are comfortable or uncomfortable doesn't matter. And since you are asking this question and opening up this topic for conversation in an institution that is dedicated to science, science doesn't care for sentiments, it only cares for the truth. Similarly, History doesn't care for sentiments, it only cares for the truth. Now, if you choose to fabricate history and you don't ask the right questions, you muddle those questions, you will get muddled answers and garbled answers. So if you are serious about revisiting history and drawing the right lesson based on facts, you must be open to be challenged by history Facts presented by history, documented facts, are bound to cause discomfort and discomfiture. You must have the ability to swallow it. There is no point in saying Satyameva Jayate if you cannot handle Satya in the first place. So over the last three to four years, people like me, or even better qualified people than me, are engaged in serious pursuit of understanding history or re-understanding Bharatiya history because in my view, history almost tends to repeat itself. And we are, in a, according to me, in a phase where perhaps the situation of 2024 is closer to the situation and the circumstances of 1924 when Khilafat 1.0 ended in December 1924. It is possible or perhaps we are inclined to believe that national identity prevails over and supersedes religious identity. We have tried to walk with that experiment for close to 75 to 78 years now. I will not offer any conclusions. I will ask the audience or members of the audience to ask themselves this question. Do you truly believe that the last 75 years tell us the story of a situation where the Indian identity has prevailed over religious identities? If the answer is a no, my simple question would be, when do you think we'll wake up and smell the coffee? And realize that this experiment may not be working despite our best intentions and efforts. History is not meant to be consumed as pastime. You don't read it like a novel or an Amar Chitrakata book over dinner. It's not meant to be consumed as an academic pursuit. History is meant to be understood as the causes of the present and the potential future. 
we are where we are because of events of the past and we will be where we will based on the events and decisions of the present if you are a believer in karma and if you are believer in bharatiya philosophy then you must necessarily come to the conclusion that the situation of the present is a product of the karma of the past and whatever you do or don't do both acts actions of commission and omission in your present will have consequences for the future so i am not here to push any particular agenda on how i want people to see history i will present my version nevertheless i would only request members of the audience especially the youth who consume information from instagram from youtube from facebook quora edit rather reddit and so many other platforms formerly twitter and now x to be very careful about what you consume through these portals everybody has their own point of view i am no exception so perhaps you are better off consuming information through rigorous sources and that is perhaps the most boring suggestion i can give you which is to read more if possible i would request members of the audience to take an active interest in the developments or let's call them regression of developments on the eastern side of bharat in what was previously called east pakistan and now called bangladesh and who knows it might become east pakistan once more please follow the developments closely based on your reading of the developments ignoring everything else what everybody else has to say please start asking certain questions what is happening there why is it happening is it even remotely relevant to bharat and our circumstances if the answer is a no great if the answer is a yes then you must ask yourself a few more questions what do we do to prevent a similar situation in my view if you had asked people in the 1900s or even in the 1920s if they could remotely think of or predict the potential partition of the sacred land called bharat in 2025 years that is after 1924 when khilafat ended if you had asked them in less than 25 years do you think bharat will be divided on religious lines most of them would have said impossible not possible we are all culturally one our religions may be different but we speak more or less the same languages we have similar cultural traits culture will prevail over religion and nation will prevail over religion that was the statement that you had heard from people of the 1920s of bharat by the time they reached 1940s mentally they understood that the situation had changed and by the time they reached 1946 karachi and lahore resolutions of the muslim league specifically told us that pakistan was going to be a reality within a year by hook or crook through democratic means or by force so it doesn't take even half a century for circumstances to change or worsen it takes less than that it depends on how aware and prepared people are i am not a pessimist i am a realist but i do believe that the generation of today is not remotely as prepared and aware as the generation of the 1920s in terms of the challenges that face bharat i don't think children should be blamed i don't think the youth must be blamed for this i would only request their parents to take history much more seriously to take culture a bit more seriously this comes from an engineer turned lawyer so i am not exactly the arts graduate who is basically telling you to focus on history and to ignore science i know the value of science as much as i know the value of history and culture you can pursue science and go to california but your identity and culture will not leave you 
So if there is one lesson that I would request students, it's a request, it's not advice. I know you have a particular hatred for that word. So let's call it just suggestion. That you should walk away with from this conversation. History is important, culture is important, identity is important. And every civilization or country which has lost its way and its identity has lost itself to the future. Europe has achieved development at least 30, 40 years or maybe even 70 years before Bharat. We are several years or decades behind the least developed country of Europe. But Europe today doesn't have the ability to protect its culture or its civilization because it has completely lost its sense of self and identity. I am not saying sacrifice development and science and infrastructure for identity. I am saying all of that is meaningless without retaining your identity. Both must go hand in hand. Perhaps that's one of the reasons when I speak of education and policy, I believe that it's an utter mistake and according to me a catastrophic mistake when you separate scientific education from arts education or humanities education. We must have a trend where we actually give dual major degrees of diametrically or seemingly diametrically opposite subjects so that students of science have a better understanding of humanities and students of humanities also understand science better. Otherwise, people coming from the humanities stream think that people from the scientific stream have no understanding of the arts and vice versa. There is a mutual contempt which I see in schools and colleges. Those who are bad at mathematics but who understand arts are seen as poor students. And those who understand mathematics but don't understand arts are seen as people without taste and class. This is how education works and ultimately when you grow into an adult, you will see its direct consequences when you realize you don't have the ability to make sense of the developments around you. Because you have been so keen on pursuing physics, chemistry and mathematics that you don't understand how do I make sense of the political, cultural and national and international developments around me. Every country which is worth its salt and which takes itself seriously prepares for the future by investing in education and specifically history education. In my view, even after 78 years, we are far behind as far as that question is concerned because we have taken forward the terrible education legacy of the colonizer without having an Indian education policy which speaks of Bharatiyata, which speaks of Bharat civilization and philosophy. We seem to have made a beginning and we have started taking baby steps. Why have I suddenly started speaking about education when the conversation is supposed to be about partition horrors? Because you understand history primarily through your textbooks when you're in schools. And if you don't take education seriously, then in the formative years when you're supposed to have a very clear picture as to who you are and where you come from and what is Bharat as a nation, your mind becomes the playground for competing forces where everybody is trying to brainwash you one way or the other. So, even in African countries, after colonization, rather decolonization or political independence, they've invested better in education policies than Bharat. Bharat doesn't need to look up to America, Singapore or any other country for education policy on, on the aspect of history. It has a lot to learn from African countries for God's sakes, such as Kenya, South Africa. With His Excellency being present here, with the Director of IIT being present here, my only suggestion would be that it's easy to reduce partition to politics or human selfishness, but there are deeper causes, much more sensitive causes, delicate causes, which may not be to everybody's liking and taste. The easier way to address this, or at least the simpler way to address this in the long run, is by capturing the causes of partition better in our history textbooks. Because there's no point in trying to convince an adult 
if 20 years of his school education and college education have taught him otherwise. It's very difficult for them to overcome that barrier and the preconceived notion. Investment in the future is through investment in the past, and investment in the past is through investment in education in the present. Vande Matram, Jai Hind.